This Georgia Department of Education screencast is intended to provide teachers of fourth grade social studies with content knowledge to aid in the teaching of the Georgia Standards of Excellence. This screencast will look at some of the main factors and events that led the colonists in America to determine that British rule had become intolerable and to declare that we would become our own independent nation. While the French and Indian War was one of the many factors that led to the Revolution, and we will briefly review why here, it was a significant enough event on its own to merit a more detailed look in a separate screencast, so you may want to check that one out as well. We will see how the Stamp Act and other taxation acts were deemed unacceptable because the colonists did not have any representation in the British Parliament, and how these taxes led local businessmen and merchants like John Adams and Paul Revere to join the Sons of Liberty in protests such as the Boston Tea Party and the inflammatory conflict of the Boston Massacre. We will also look at the contributions of the Daughters of Liberty, John Adams and Paul Revere, as they relate to these events. So let's start out by looking at what caused the colonists to take such a drastic step as to basically commit treason by declaring our independence from England. It would be impossible to tell exactly when the seeds of discontent were sown, as it was not one specific incident, but rather a pattern of behaviors, rulings, events, and acts that made the colonists feel disconnected from their government and king. But many historians, and our standard, begin with the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War was a war between the British colonists and the French colonists over some prime land west of the Appalachian Mountains known as the Ohio River Valley. France had claimed that region for herself and said it was a part of New France, but the British colonists disputed that claim. Conflict ensued that was actually a part of a larger war between England and France called the Seven Years' War, and France lost. As a result, France lost her claim on that land, and the colonists felt that they could now settle it. Unfortunately for them, there had been a number of American Indian uprisings in the area, and King George III determined that the region should instead become a reservation for the American Indians of the region. On top of that, the King and Parliament, England's legislative body, felt the colonists should bear the burden of the expenses for the war. To this end, they began passing acts that called for the colonists to pay taxes. One of the first of these acts was the Stamp Act of 1765. The Stamp Act was given that name because it placed a tax on all papers and documents, and those papers would bear a stamp on them to show that the tax had been paid. To make matters worse, the Stamp Act determined that violators of the Stamp Act would not receive a trial by jury, but rather be tried in a juryless court. The colonists responded by calling a Stamp Act Congress to discuss the issue. After much heated debate between the radicals and moderates, the Congress determined that while England had the right to govern the colonies, they did not have the right to tax us when we did not have any representation in Parliament. And so we got the rallying cry of, no taxation without representation. They meant that quite literally. Since the colonies did not have any say in the creation of the laws, they should not have to pay taxes. It may surprise many to know that Benjamin Franklin originally supported the Stamp Act despite the fact that, as a printer in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, he was required, under the provisions of the Stamp Act, to use only imported paper, thereby necessitating that he pay the tax. At this time, Franklin was mostly living in London, England, as a representative of Pennsylvania, and as any good representative should, when he heard that the majority of the colonists in Pennsylvania, whom he was representing, opposed the Stamp Act, he began to speak out against it as well. In 1765, he went before Parliament in his capacity to testify against it. Outrage in Boston, Massachusetts was so great that a group of local businessmen, who referred to themselves as the Loyal Nine, got together and anonymously wrote and sent a letter to the stamp officer in charge of collecting this tax, telling him that he must resign his office at the Liberty Tree, which was a well-known tree in the center of Boston. By noon of the next day, which he did. The Loyal Nine soon became known as the Sons of Liberty, as they continued to organize protests against laws and taxes that they felt were unfair. Another protest organized by the Sons of Liberty was the Boston Tea Party. Despite its festive name, the Boston Tea Party was an act of serious rebellion that resulted in the loss of 90,000 pounds of tea that would be worth almost a million dollars in today's economy. Tea which belonged to the king. Needless to say, the king was not happy, but we will get into that in a bit. The whole business started with the Tea Act, which Parliament passed to help keep the East India Tea Company afloat because England benefited from its presence in India. 
The Tea Act basically said that the East India Tea Company would be the only ones to sell tea in the colonies, but that they would no longer have to stop in England and get charged a tax. They could go straight to America, but once there, the colonists still had to pay the tax on the tea that was a part of the Townsend Acts, a set of taxes charged on a number of different goods. This would actually make the tea cheaper than even the smuggled tea that the colonists were drinking to avoid buying English tea and paying the tax. The king and parliament thought the colonists would be happy with this and buy up the tea. But by allowing the East India Tea Company to sell directly to the colonists, they were bypassing the colonial merchants. Worse still, many of the appointed sellers of the tea were members of parliament, causing the local merchants to smell a rat. Now many of the colonial cities turned the ships away and would not allow them to dock, but in Boston they were allowed in. The Sons of Liberty, including a prominent and respected lawyer by the name of John Adams, and a silversmith and artist named Paul Revere, dressed as American Indians, boarded the ships and dumped all of the tea into the harbor. The king was furious and responded with a set of acts called the Coercive Acts, but dubbed the Intolerable Acts by the colonists. Another incident that helped light the fuse of the American Revolution also occurred in Boston. Soldiers had been brought into Boston at the request of the tax collectors to protect them from the protesting colonists. The incident started because a group of angry colonists were harassing the soldier posted to guard the Customs House on King Street, which is where the officers charged with collecting the taxes worked. The colonists were taunting the soldier and began throwing snowballs at him. As the crowd became more unruly, the soldier sent word back to his unit to send him some support. The crowd of colonists grew even larger, and when the other soldiers arrived, in the ensuing chaos, the soldiers ended up firing on the crowd, killing five colonists. Paul Revere, one of the Sons of Liberty, stirred the colonists' anger and resentment even further with his depiction of the incident in the famous engraving entitled The Bloody Massacre on King Street. Anyone who reads the text beneath the engraving would have no doubt that Revere's sympathies lay with the colonists. A further comparison of the engraving against the historical accounts of the event would reveal it to be rather sensationalistic as well, and biased towards the colonists. But this should come as no surprise given Revere's career as a craftsman, who were often at odds with the king's decrees, and, of course, his membership in the Sons of Liberty, though that was not public knowledge, as the Sons were quite secretive. They had to be, considering the nature of their activities. Because of societal expectations of women during this time period, we would not have seen the Daughters of Liberty boarding ships and tossing tea, or wrestling with tax collectors, but that does not mean that they did not have a part in all of this. The term Daughters of Liberty was one that was applied to the women who supported the colonists' growing protests against taxes and other unfair acts perpetrated by King George III and Parliament. This support was generally in the form of organizing and participating in boycotts of taxed goods and in producing substitutes for people to consume instead. In the case of tea, many revolutionary era women developed herbal teas made with the leaves of mint, raspberry, or other herbs to drink instead. These teas were often given the name Liberty Tea. They also participated in large spinning bees where they gathered with their spinning wheels to turn wool into homespun cloth, thereby avoiding the purchase of taxed British textiles. Many young women even went so far as to refuse to marry under a marriage license that had a Stamp Act stamp on it. While at first this may not seem like much, as the primary purchaser for the households, their buying power, or really boycotting power as it were, was significant so much so that it was their organized boycott of tea in protest to the Townsend Acts that was partially responsible for the East India Tea Company's surplus of tea that necessitated the Tea Act. And so that concludes our look at the events that shaped the revolutionary movement in America. That's all for now. We'll see you next time. Here are some helpful links where you can find resources to enrich your studies of the American Revolution, as well as the works used in the creation of this screencast. 